Well, hello and welcome to 2 Samuel chapter 10. This is where David has a bit of a skirmish with the Ammonites and a whole variety of kings to the north of Israel. A few contextual ideas will help us as we go forward in our text today. 2 Samuel 10, as you see it in your scriptures here, is no doubt a part of the events that occurred around the same time of 2 Samuel 8 with those battles where David fought, where he basically went around the compass, solidifying his uh, kingdom. And so a question becomes, why does the author of Samuel take it out of its historical context and place it after the episode with Mephibosheth, where David shows kindness uh, to him? I think it is for two reasons. The first, the episode with the Ammonites here is juxtaposed with the kindness that David showed Mephibosheth. So David shows this man Mephibosheth kindness and love because of his compassion he had to Jonathan. And then in this case, we're going to see David wants to show equal compassion to the Ammonites after the death of their leader. And we'll see how that goes. So it's a contrast with that. But the second reason is probably the more important one. This is the background to the large scale failure of David's life. It seems successful here in 2 Samuel 10. But when we get to 2 Samuel 11, with the background to the episode with Bathsheba, we realize that the way David started to handle battles that first begun here with the defeat of the Ammonites was the slow descent to David making poor choices. And what we have seen increasingly is when you make a poor choice, it gives license and ability to make increasingly poorer choices. And that's what we'll also see towards the end of our text today. But the text will come up, and then we'll come back and look at a few things together. 2 Samuel chapter 10. In the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died, and his son Hanun succeeded him as king. David thought, I will show kindness to Hanun son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanun concerning his father. When David's men came to the land of the Ammonites... The Ammonite commanders said to Hanun their lord, Do you think David is honouring your father by sending envoys to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them to you only to explore the city and spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanun seized David's envoys, shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their garments at the buttocks and sent them away. When David was told about this, he sent messages to meet the men. For they were greatly humiliated. The king said, Stay at Jericho till your beards have grown, and then come back. When the Ammonites realized that they had become obnoxious to David, they hired 20,000 Aramean foot soldiers from Beth Rehob and Zobah, as well as the king of Maacah with a thousand men, and also 12,000 men from Tob. On hearing this, David sent Joab out with the entire army of fighting men. The Ammonites came out and drew up in battle formation at the entrance of the city gate, while the Arameans of Zobar and Rehob and the men of Tob and Maacah were by themselves in the open country. Joab saw that there were battle lines in front of him and behind him, so he selected some of the best troops in Israel and deployed them against the Arameans. He put the rest of the men under the command of Abishai, his brother, and deployed them against the Ammonites. Joab said, If the Arameans are too strong for me, then you are to come to my rescue. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come to rescue you. Be strong and let us fight bravely for our people and the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is good in his sight. Then Joab and the troops with him advanced to fight the Arameans and they fled before him. When the Ammonites realized that the Arameans were fleeing, they fled before Abishai and went inside the city. So Joab returned from fighting the Ammonites and came to Jerusalem. After the Arameans saw that they had been routed by Israel, they regrouped. Hadad Ezer had Arameans bought from beyond the Euphrates River. They went to Hilam with Sholbak, the commander of Hadad Ezer's army, leading them. When David was told of this, he gathered all Israel, crossed the Jordan, and went to Hilam. The Arameans formed their battle lines to meet David and fought against him, but they fled before Israel, and David killed 700 of their charioteers and 40,000 of their foot soldiers. He also struck down Shobak, the commander of their army, and he died there. When all the kings 
who were vassals of Hadad Ezer, saw that they had been routed by Israel, they made peace with the Israelites and became subject to them. So the Aramaeans were afraid to help the Ammonites anymore. So the Ammonites were a group of peoples to the north of uh, Israel on the other side of the Jordan River who, like a variety of nations like Edom and Moab and the Philistines, had a long history of hatred towards the Philistines and towards Jerusalem where the people of God currently are at in Israel. And so it's no laughing matter really for the Ammonites to have the king of Israel come to him and appear to be kind. In fact, they were greatly distressed. And it would strike us as altogether logical because we recall one David being duplicitous to the Philistines when he tried to appear to be a friend of the king of Gath. But in effect, he was at duplicitous the entire time. And so just maybe the Ammonites are in their right idea to be a little worried about David's seemingly kind attitude. But it seems like the text is portraying that David was certainly a man who was wanting to show honour, perceivably because of an episode where the king Nahash had shown David at least some sense of honour when he was on the run, an episode that's not contained itself within the scriptures. And after this particular humiliation given to the envoys of David, there's a couple of things we can learn. Firstly, David did not initiate revenge. That might be surprising to us because of the way that David handled some of the battles in 2 Samuel 8, especially with the Edomites and the Moabites. David did not initiate the revenge. He did not take justice into his own hands here. In fact, it was the shame and guilt that was now felt by the Ammonites. They could have come back and said, look, sorry, we overreacted. We interpreted the events this way, not realizing that you meant them to be kindness. But they didn't do that. There are two battles in our text today, the first by the Ammonites and the second by the forces of the Aramaeans and the, and the Syrians. The first battle is with the Ammonites and where Joab turns up. And we know old Joab, he's one of the greatest military minds in Israel's history. And he, with his brother, manages to actually divide the forces rather than be crushed by them. He divides them by an astute form of tactical awareness about where the actual stronger troops would be and he splits the forces and makes them flee to the extent that the Ammonites really are crushed by it or at least temporarily and the second one leads to the Aramaeans and the Syrians fleeing but they don't actually ask for uh, forgiveness either they regroup these are the people brought into the battle they regroup and go again and this time David turns up we may ask where was David the first time why was Joab and Abishai there. More of that when we get to 2 Samuel 11. What are we supposed to take out of this? Well, I think the key thing we can take out of it is that David is a man, certainly after God's own heart, but certainly he is slowly moving away from the king that God would have wanted him to be. And in fact, in the weirdest possible way, when you think about the history of Joab and David, it is Joab who says some of the most amazing lines in the entire Bible. Verse 11, if the Aramaeans are too strong for me, well, that doesn't seem too amazing. It seems military tactics, but drop your eyes down to verse 12. He moves from talking about military tactics, which we know he's good at, and he's a killer and a dictator at heart. He says, be strong and let us fight bravely. Why? For our people and the cities of our God, the Lord will do what is good in his sight. David should have said that. David should have been there to say it. He should have been a man who recognized that this was a slight against his God that he should have stood up for, like he did with Goliath, like he did with a lot of battles in 2 Samuel 8. But Joab said it. And sometimes people say things under the threat of death, under the fear of annihilation, that they say things often that either they don't believe in or they believe in a little bit. But when push comes to shove, their life, when it gets back to normal, goes back to their own life, their own way. We often see this around times of funerals where people have a desire to be more religious. But we don't need people to be more religious. We need people to be more faithful. And the faith of Joab was rewarded here by God, not because Joab was increasingly faithful, but because God was faithful to his promises and was looking after his people. So we occasionally will see people, 
be faithful when at other times they are not. And we should always try and encourage them to take that more seriously, not just at times of trouble or in times of fearful destitution. We should ask them to take it seriously all the time. Joab couldn't do it. Hopefully our family and, and friends, which may be like Joab, actually do. What else can we learn? Well, the other thing we can learn here occurs right near the end. And that is, those who stand up against God and try and bring shame on God eventually will face judgment. All the nations that stood up against God here face the judgment of God. And that will be the long-term consequences of all those who come out against God and try and bring shame upon him. The sad reality is that their ignorance was not rewarded. Their ignorance resulted in destruction for the entire armies that were under their control. But the good news is, those who ask God for help, like Joab did in verse 11 and 12, are rewarded with God's help because God's promise was to keep his people safe. Amen.